imagine for a moment that you wake up tomorrow morning and you slowly realize that something is different. You know that something is missing, but you can't quite tell what it is. After the initial period of confusion, you finally realize that this time flowers have disappeared. Throughout your lifetime, other items have disappeared as well. Hats, jewelry, fruit. You look at the flowers in your house, but you can't seem to remember what they were or why they mattered. You look outside your house, and you see your neighbors throwing together giant piles of what used to be flowers and burning them to avoid any suspicion. You join them and destroy any trace of the flowers in your home so that you won't be punished. Soon enough, the memory police show up and start throwing some of your neighbors in a van, hauling them off never to be seen again. Their fate is never really resolved. After all, it's dangerous to ask about them, but you know that their fate can't be good. On this day, it was flowers in the burn pile, which might not be a big deal for you, but tomorrow and the day after, it might be something that is more meaningful. Photographs, personal letters, books. Anyone who is immune to these disappearances and strange bouts of forgetting, anyone at all who continues to remember the items that are disappeared is hunted down and abducted. If this was your world, what sort of impact would these disappearances have on your identity and your sense of self? How would that constant stream of loss over time impact you psychologically? This concept of things disappearing and memories being lost is the basic plot idea behind Yoko Ogawa's strange and surreal 1994 novel, The Memory Police. Over the last few weeks on the podcast, we've been investigating the concept of memory and the different aspects of it that are interesting to think about and maybe relevant to psychology or philosophy or history. And whereas the last episode on the buried giant focused on ideas of collective memory and shared history being lost and how that might impact a society, this novel takes a much more personal approach to memory and what it means for each person's sense of self. The main character of the book is an unnamed woman. None of the characters in the book have names, by the way, which is interesting, and you may see why. It doesn't say how old she is, but I would guess somewhere in her 30s or 40s. As the book progresses, it's no surprise that different things continue to disappear slowly but surely, and much of the book simply follows the narrator's interaction with herself and the world around her as she changes over time as a result of these disappearances. As different things are lost to memory, it's a bit of a two-step process. The first step is internal, where the narrator, through maybe some supernatural means, no longer has access to memory or meaning for that particular object. Say that chess disappears one day. What was a chess set with queen and rook and bishop yesterday is now just a strange checkered board with bizarre carved pieces on top. You know it was chess, but you don't really know what it means. And before long, you've forgotten chess altogether. So in addition to the initial forgetting, the second part of the disappearance is the enforcement. Once chess disappears, any mention of chess or physical evidence of having it and not destroying it is now a crime. So writing about chess or talking about it or having a hidden chess set 
in the basement at home would be punishable by abduction or death. As mentioned before, all of these disappearances are enforced by the memory police, reminiscent of the Gestapo of Nazi Germany down to the uniforms and the sleeved logos. The memory police obviously are unafraid to use violence and treachery to uncover any who oppose the disappearances. And as you're reading the book, your first initial questions might be about the memory police. Who are they? What are their motives? Why do they seem to be immune from some of the disappearances themselves? Who are they led by? How did they come to power? How is the main character going to infiltrate this organization and take them down? How do they compare to other authoritarian governments in the past or maybe even the present? So these types of questions about the memory police come to mind early on in the book, and it's no surprise that many readers interpret this novel as a traditional dystopian novel. Oftentimes, these dystopian novels have some sort of oppressive, authoritarian, evil government that controls aspects of ordinary people's lives in a total and destructive way. There's often mass surveillance and propaganda and Big Brother-style dictators with cults of personality. 1984 by George Orwell probably comes across as the classic dystopian novel. And there's a reason these types of books are read and studied in academic institutions. It's interesting, it's entertaining, and it's instructive sometimes to draw parallels from these types of dystopian novels to historical examples like Nazi Germany or Soviet Russia. And as we said, sometimes these books are also used to draw modern parallels and are sometimes shown as cautionary tales for certain trajectories that we might be on, or at least maybe charting a course in the modern day. I think that the memory police sometimes gets lumped into this category of dystopian novel. Just as an example of people interpreting the memory police in this way, here are some blurbs from reviewers and news organizations that I'm looking at right now, just on the back cover of the book, by the way. One says, quote, an elegantly spare dystopian fable, end quote. Another says, quote, Ogawa's fable echoes the themes of George Orwell's 1984, Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude, but it has a voice and power all its own, end quote. Clearly, many news organizations and reviewers and even the publisher himself in this case, creating that back cover for the book, is okay with this book being lumped into this dystopian novel category. And it certainly does fit in, make no mistake about it. And those might just be small quotes from those reviewers that don't give the full context of what they're saying. But to me, one of the interesting things about the memory police and one of the things that makes it so memorable, for me at least, is that to me it would be a mistake to interpret this book through a simple dystopian political lens. In fact, I think Yoko Ogawa goes out of her way to avoid this interpretation of her book by making the answers to the typical dystopian questions you might have about the memory police in the book very disappointing. Unlike a book like, say, Fahrenheit 451, where the motivations of the evil government who is burning all the books is pretty clear, or at least strongly implied, and easily understandable from a perspective of power and control and these types of things. In this book, 
it's never entirely clear who the memory police are, why they're there, who they're led by, how they might compare to other authoritarian governments the reader might know of. So the reader of the book is left to interpret much of this on their own, and I think the book becomes a bit more philosophical and, in my view, meaningful as a result. You're left to interpret who the memory police are and what these disappearances of objects and things and ultimately memory itself means to you as you continue reading. So if this book is not a dystopian political warning novel in the style of 1984, and if many reviewers and news organizations seem to have missed the boat on this, then what is this book actually about? I'd like to highlight a couple of themes and ideas that I think are important and relevant philosophically to the study of history and psychology. The first idea here is related to this concept of the classic dystopian novel that we've been talking about. There's this concept of what I call quiet authoritarianism. I think in life we often want the enemy to be something or someone tangible. We want there to be a single bad guy to blame things on, a big boss at the end of the level who gives villainous speeches and wears a black cape. I know I've quoted this before, but I'm going to do it again because it's relevant and short here, but as the great George R.R. R. Martin once said, quote, The battle between good and evil is a legitimate theme for a fantasy, or for any work of fiction for that matter. But in real life, that battle is fought chiefly in the individual human heart. Too many contemporary fantasies take the easy way out by externalizing the struggle. So the heroic protagonist need only smite the evil minions of the dark power to win the day. And you can tell the evil minions because they're inevitably ugly and they all wear black. I wanted to stand much of that on its head. In real life, the hardest aspect of the battle between good and evil is determining which is which. End quote. Now, obviously, in the book, the memory police serve as the antagonist and the bad guy in the black uniform. But once it becomes increasingly clear that you aren't really learning anything about them as you're reading, nobody seems to be resisting them, and they don't really seem to have any motivations for their actions, you're left to wonder to what extent is their complicity for the disappearances that are happening among the population of the island. Throughout the novel, you're witness to some horrible scenes as the memory police raid houses, take away children, burn libraries, and so on. And of course, you're rooting for someone, really anyone, to fight back or do something direct to stop the memory police but it never seems to happen. In fact, the opposite seems to happen. People initially struggle with each new disappearance, but then they gradually become accustomed to it and ultimately find ways to live their life around whatever the disappearance was. In this way, eventually those memories are forgotten and people move on. One way that Ogawa demonstrates this idea is by gradually ramping up the stakes on what is being disappeared. If it's just chess that disappears, you may lose some nostalgic memories of playing with your friends and maybe even a small sense of self that comes with this hobby, but you can still reasonably move on with life and forget about it. But what if something important to you was disappeared and you had to be constantly reminded about it all the time. And you had that vague, longing feeling of having lost something without any means of getting it back, or even knowing what it is. In the novel, 
This is borne out when individual parts of the body start to disappear. So the narrator now has to walk around knowing that part of them is no longer there. This makes it harder to forget. Sometimes it's more uncomfortable to have to carry something around with you that you would rather forget, rather than simply just forgetting it. There are some interesting parallels to be made related to this concept of forgetting, parallels to the types of historical stories that matter and need to be told and would sometimes rather be forgotten by some in the name of moving on, and how sometimes just making an effort to remember those stories could in some small way be a form of resistance against the authoritarian crushing wheel of time. So in addition to this concept of quiet authoritarianism and its impact on memory and history, the book explores the idea of resistance to authoritarianism, both direct and quiet. Probably the most direct act of bravery in the novel is the narrator's decision to hide her friend R in the house. The narrator and her best friend, known as the old man, build a secret room in her house for this R person where he stays undetected by the memory police. This is obviously a huge and life-altering decision that requires planning and secrecy and constant vigilance. R still has his memories and seems to be immune from the disappearances, which makes him, of course, target number one for the memory police. In addition to trying to protect him, at other moments, the narrator adopts a dog or keeps R up to date on what's happening with his family and vice versa. And these quiet acts of bravery are supplemented by the narrator taking part in quiet acts of kindness to ease the burden of the memory police and the disappearances. Celebrating a birthday party in the hidden room with R and the old man, spending time talking with the old man about his life, visiting the memory police headquarters and searching for the old man when he was abducted. These small acts are quietly inspiring and a reminder that not all resistance to authoritarianism happens with guns and explosions. Examples of these small acts of kindness and bravery are littered throughout the book and are especially poignant when you remember the setting and the context of the book and the fact that everyone on the island is dealing with grief and loss in some form or another. Everyone knows someone who was taken by the memory police. Some may have lost friends or family members. And even if that's not the case, everyone at some point has lost something important to them through the disappearances, whether a cherished memory, person, an idea. So a small act of decency can potentially travel a longer way under these circumstances. As the novel progresses and R continues to hide in the room in the narrator's house, he encourages her to try to remember some of the things that she has lost. Eventually, she starts hiding items that have disappeared in the secret room and tries to reminisce on what they were and what they meant to her with R. It's ultimately a futile effort for the narrator who continues growing weaker throughout the story, but R seems to absorb these memories from her even if she can't remember them, and he seems to get stronger as the book goes on. The secret room itself slowly becomes a storehouse of forgotten memories. Ultimately, the book ends on a vague and confusing note, as the narrator continues to lose things close to her, including physical parts of herself, until she has slowly disappeared into nothing. Once this happens, she is left in the secret room, 
with all of her forgotten memories, R is now able to leave because there's nothing left for anyone to remember, including the fact that he is a fugitive. So what does it all mean? Like any great book or piece of art, it's hard to say. As R is leaving, there is a ray of sunshine peeking through before he closes the trap door. Perhaps this is symbolic for how, although the narrator does ultimately disappear and her memories with her, maybe she did leave something behind through R. R was able to absorb some of her memories for the time that he was in hiding. And now maybe he is able to go out and share that legacy with others who still remember. This speaks to the power of memory and the power of preserving memory even in the face of authoritarianism and evil. It also speaks to the power of storytelling and the value of history, the shared legacy that we leave behind. The narrator, whose job in the book happens to be a novelist, by the way, is unknowingly telling a story to R throughout the book through her memories. She is encoding memories for the future through her life, pouring herself into something that can be retained for others in the future, one of the main functions of memory. This idea would seem to be supported by the parallel journey of the typist in the story, which I won't go into at all at the moment, but maybe you'll agree if you end up reading the book. The book also speaks to the role of human contact and friendship and how important those things are to preserving memory and maintaining your sense of self. The narrator's relationships with the old man and R are ultimately what allow her to uncover and preserve her disappeared memories. But they are also what allow her to simply get through each day under oppressive and evil circumstances. Now, as I said before, none of the characters have proper names, which I think is interesting and probably a deliberate choice. And earlier we contrasted the more overt authoritarian and dystopian style of a book like 1984 with this one, where the memory police are more vague and it's unclear how to make sense of them. One theory might be that in a abstract way, like the secondary characters in the book, potentially, the memory police don't exist at all. They are simply a hypercharged symbol for the natural process of aging, forgetting, and death. In one sense, memory is grief and loss, and these things are inevitable in life. From this perspective, life is a constant stream of picking up new things and letting old things go, and the memory police represent this constant struggle in our heads where old memories are uplifted and set aside to make room for something new. So perhaps death is when ideas and memories are forgotten faster than they can be created and the narrator's journey in the novel represents her lifelong struggle to encode meaning into her memories and pass them on. Or maybe not. There's a lot in this book that I didn't mention or attempt to make sense of, including the narrator's relationship with her mother, R and the narrator's growing and budding romance, the side story with the typist that we mentioned. So maybe you can figure it all out if you go and give it a read, obviously, I highly recommend it. At any rate, perhaps ironically, I think I'll remember the memory police for a long time. <laughs> 